Welcome to EPG Pathshala. I'll be doing module 6 now and it deals with women in armed conflict. Since time immemorial, we always have war, combat as a male domain. Whenever we talk about war or combat, the picture that comes to our mind is about men in their military dresses. However, it has been seen that ever since there has been war or conflict, there has been examples of women participating in combat. We have records of the Amazons. The Greek legend of Amazons, warrior of women who lived beyond the borders of civilization and inverted normal gender roles. According to the legend, this tribe of female warriors were devotees of Artemis, goddess of the hunt. The first mention of the Amazons appear in the Homer's Iliad, which tells that they had assisted the Trojans in the Trojan War. A recurrent theme was that the Amazon warriors were wild and they had to be tamed by Greek men who were endowed with superior gift of reason. The ultimate purpose of these tales was to reinforce Greek idea of gender, not to overturn them. And the story of Amazon probably originated as a variant of a tale recurrent in many cultures, that of a distant land organized oppositely from one's own. The ascribed habitat of the Amazons necessarily became more remote as Greek geographic knowledge developed. When the Black Sea region was colonized by Greeks, it was said to be the Amazon district. But when no Amazons were found there, it was necessary to explain what had become of them. Traditionally, one of the labors required of the Greek hero Heracles, popularly known as Hercules, was leading an expedition to obtain the griddle of Hippolyte, the queen of the Amazons, during which he was said to have con conquered and expelled them all from their districts. Penthesilea led an army of Amazons to fight for Troy against the Greeks but she was killed by Achilles, who later mourned her. Subsidiary tales grew up to explain why if the whole nation consisted of women, it need not die in one generation. The most common explanation was that the Amazons mated with men of other people, kept resulting in, in female children and the male children were sent to their fathers. In another tale, Theseus attacked the Amazons either with Heracles or independently. The Amazons in turn evaded Attica but were finally defeated and at some point Theseus married one of them, Antito. In Hellenistic times, the Amazons were associated with Diocese, the god of wine either as his allies or more common, commonly as his opponents. History has records of women leading armies and being active participants as far back as the first century AD. Examples of women combatants are not restricted to a particular era or a particular part of the globe. Ayesha, the wife of Prophet Muhammad, raised a small army to confront Ali's troop outside the city of Basra. Ayesha personally directed her forces from the back of the camel, but the battle known as the Battle of the Camel ended in a crushing defeat for her. There is another example from ancient China. Ancient China has many legends of women warriors. China's 
most celebrated woman warrior was the legend Hua Mulan or Fa Mulan, who was who in the fifth century AD reputedly took place of her constipated but ill father. According to the Chinese legend, Hua Mulan with her hair cut short and wearing father's armor fought for 10 years with valor without her sex being discovered. We have another example of Artemisia who was the queen of Anatolian region of Caria. She was famous for her role in the naval battle of Salamis in 480 BC. She served as one of the Zeus's naval commander. Herodotus reports that Artemisia sailed a command of men in Helicarnus, Kos, Nisiria and Calidia and furnished five ships of war. Not one of the confederate commanders gave Zeus's sounder advice than she did. Zuxus was reportedly observed, my men behaved like women, my women like men, when he was told that she had sunk an enemy ship. Eliza Ellen, a female volunteer who disguised as a man, fought in the US Army in the Mexican War of 1846 to 1848. Rani Lakshmi Bai, popularly known as Jhansi Ki Rani, fiercely resisted the British in India's first war of independence. She was proficient in horse riding, sword fighting and shooting. She personally oversaw the strengthening of fortifications of Jhansi and assembled an army. She recruited women into her army and they were given military training. Another woman, Joan of Arc, a proficient horse rider and fighter, marshaled an army of 10,000 to 12,000 men and led them to Orleans in 1429. She managed to discipline the men and prevented her army from looting and harassing civilians. Woman has always worked in a supporting role like nursing, providing food and provisions and working in the intelligence wings in the militaries and in war. Then we have Valentina Stepanova Girzodudova. She was the sole woman commanding officer of the men's wing during World War II and one of the few Soviet women to attain the rank of full colonel. This position did not challenge the existing patriarchal notions of woman's basic nature as caregiver and homemakers. No matter how fiercely they fought battles, yet the notion of woman as a weaker sex, as a caregiver, caretaker could never be broken. Although there has been examples of women leading and fighting wars from the first century, it is the world wars that saw the change in both numbers of women who participated in the wars and the nature of the roles played by women. Before the world wars, women's role in wars was limited. However, the scale and style of world wars required large number of women to participate in it. It was during World War I that women were continuing to work as nurses and they began to work in also in communication and clerical work. I quote, 
the nature of the all out war with all the resources and hands needed at work changed the dynamics of society. Women were an integral part of the war effort. They were needed to win the war." Unquote. Russia was the first country to have all female combat in World War I. During World War II, it was seen that there was a dearth of manpower which led to women taking jobs traditionally held by men. They began to work as mechanics, truck drivers and air tower control operators. Army nurses served in the front lines in North Africa and Anzio and members of the Women's Army Corps in London during the German bomb bombing. Since World War II, service women have begun to work in areas as diverse as technical jobs to intelligence, law enforcement, logistics, combat and command roles. Women are now essential part of armed forces across the world. They have become a vital part of the fighting units. As mentioned earlier, Russia was the first country to have all women combat unit during World War I. During the Second World War, Soviet women engaged in combat in every branch of their armed forces. Their services as combat pilots were specially notable. The most famous of these were the Night Witches, an all woman squadron of bomber pilots who flew only at night because their canvas and wood biplanes were too slow to fly daylight mission. Women played a crucial part in World War II. From working in weapons factories, to growing food for soldiers, to working as nurses for the wounded, women were vital to a country's ability to continue fighting. This is even clearer in Russia, where many women were employed by the military in a variety of ways. They could be tank drivers, machine gunners, snipers, pilots, and more. Women were thought to be ideal snipers because they were smaller, more agile, and were able to conceal themselves in places where men could not. As a result, the Soviet army employed roughly 800,000 women. Some of the most effective were the female snipers, who were credited with approximately 12,000 total confirmed kills. The women shown in this picture are responsible for 775 total kills. However, there was one woman that outshined the rest of her female companions. This woman was Ludmila Pavlichenko. Pavlichenko was 24 years old when she first joined the Soviet Army in 1941. She recorded an astounding 309 confirmed kills before she was wounded by mortar fire in 1942. By this time, she had been noticed by many people, and her fame was growing. Another group of famous Russian women were the female pilots. Also called night witches, these women were employed by the Soviet Army to fly harassment bombing missions at night. They flew in old, outdated planes and often had to fly multiple missions in one night. These women were responsible for bombing enemy encampments to destroy supplies and prevent soldiers from sleeping. These missions, although successful, were very dangerous. The pilots had gained a fierce reputation in Germany, so soldiers were rewarded if they managed to bring one down. The women had to fly through enemy fire in wooden planes that could easily catch fire if hit. The planes were also slower than German ones, which was both an advantage and a disadvantage. The slower planes were easier to hit, but were also easier to maneuver than the fast German planes. As the night witches became more of a problem, the Germans invented new ways to bring them down. Using searchlights and guns, they protected any buildings that might be targets. If a Soviet plane tried to bomb the building, it would be shot down long before it could reach the appropriate distance. However, the night witches soon found a strategy to defeat the German defenses. They flew in groups of three planes. When they got close to the target, two planes would act as bait and draw the searchlights away. The third would then fly towards the target relatively unobstructed. 
After the first plane had dropped her bombs, the pilots would exchange roles until each plane had hit the target. By the end of the war, the Night Witches had flown 30,000 total missions and dropped about 23,000 tons of ammunition on German camps. Soviet women during World War II were fierce and deadly. Their ability to keep their heads in stressful situations made them ideal soldiers, whether they were snipers, pilots, or any other job. Their bravery matched or even exceeded their male counterparts. These women were heroes in their countries and icons to women all around the world. A Soviet woman became the first woman ace with 12 kills. 30 Soviet woman pilots were declared heroes of Soviet Union. Post-World War II and as a result of the Cold War phase, there has been an increase in conflicts all over the world. I quote, the 20th century has witnessed 250 wars and over 100 million casualties. During the 1990s, in an average year, half of the world's population lived in a country that was at war, unquote. However, this is a comparatively recent phenomenon. It was only in 2013 that the U.S. state military, which has the highest number of women in the state military in the world, lifted a ban on women participating in direct ground combat. There are still restrictions on women's participation in combat in dangerous situations. At present, only 25 countries in the entire world allow women in combat roles. The 20th century conflicts have given rise to a number of women in militaries. Women in state militaries are seen in Asia, Europe, North and South America, Europe and Sri Lanka. Now, let us see the countries. Women are allowed in frontline duties with a few restrictions. Pakistan is the only Islamic country to have women soldiers and officers with high ranking assignment and general officers roles. Barring Navy, women are allowed in combat roles. In USA, we see that they have opened direct combat roles for women since 2013. However, there has been very few women in infantry positions. Positions are assigned on voluntary basis. There are still restrictions on women's participation in combat in dangerous situation. I quote, Beginning in January 2016, all military occupations and positions opened to women without exceptions. For the first time in US military history, as long as they qualified and met specific standards, women were able to contribute to the Department of Defense mission with no barriers in their way. In Britain, Women can join all positions except those where they require to kill the enemy. Denmark, Finland, Germany and Norway allow women in all positions. Most countries which allow women in frontline positions are from the developed nations of Europe. Australia and New Zealand allow women in frontline combat. In Brazil, women are allowed in carrier ranks only in the army. In Navy and Air Force, women serve as women reserve force. In India, although a large number of women are in the defense medical and allied services, they are not allowed in combat roles. The Indian President Pranab Mukherjee on the eve of Parliament's budget session said, I quote, my government has approved the induction of women as short service commission officers and as fighter pilots in the Indian Air Force. 
in future, my government will induct women in all the fighter streams of our armed forces. In our country, Shakti, which means power, is the manifestation of female energy. This Shakti defines our strength." Unquote. Women have been allowed to serve as officers in combat support roles and combat support armed and services since the early 1990s. Out of 1.3 million active personnel in Indian armed forces, only 2.5 percent are female. The majority, 1,436 women serve in the Indian Army, 1,331 in the Indian Air Force, 532 in Indian Navy. Though it has long been indicated women have fought in battles since a long time and though they constitute 10 to 30 percent of the fighting soldiers, there has been little research done on them. In this context, an ILO research project on this subject carried out in Liberia is of special significance. This project conducted interviews with women who had joined the war to fight. Their narratives indicated the extent and brutality that women face in war. Many took up arms in self-defense to protect themselves from being killed or raped. Ellen enlisted at age 16 after being raped by the same men that had killed her mother and father right before her eyes. Another Liberian woman joined up by learning that a woman who had recently given birth and been raped so brutally that she bled to death. Many of this female becoming a soldier was a matter of kill or be killed. However, there has been another reason also why women join army to fight as combatants. Many grow up in families where fathers and brothers are soldiers fighting for their country. Fired by a sense of nationalism, the women feel that they too can make a contribution in this area as well and do as well as the men. They wish to prove their equality. Quote, I want to help the rebellion. I thought that if my brothers could do it, so could I. I wanted to do like my brothers. When you are little, you want to do as if you are tall. If when you are a girl, do as if you are a boy." Unquote. This was said by Catherine from the Democratic Republic of Congo. The following excerpt is from the report that highlights some of the challenges that women combatants face. I quote, although the war in Liberia has ended, the exploitation and abuse of girls and women have not. Female ex-combatants face many obstacles in their effort to return to normal life, an indication that many men do not treat women fairly in times of peace either. While reintegration of ex-soldiers into society is critical to peace building and reconstruction, previously existing programs tended to reintegrate girls back into harmful situations they came from, thereby ignoring the underlying issues that drove them to fight in the first place. Recently, others have agreed to disarm, but their future remains clouded in questions. Will they receive the assistance needed to return to society as functioning civilians, mothers and wives? Will they be accepted and treated with respect? Will they be able to navigate through training courses and education to jobs that allow them to earn a decent living? And how will those who are too scared to come out and register as ex-combatants be treated? 
So far, reintegration assistance have been seriously delayed and the absorption capacity of the war-torn labor market is not promising. The result of all this uncertainty is that girls and women refuse to show up at disarmament, demobilization and recruitment. That is DDR cantonment sites. Afraid to confront man at these places, they dread dealing with disturbing memories of life in army camps, memories they would rather forget. Many hesitate to register as ex-combatants because that would entail having their pictures taken for identification cards. Their fear of being labeled as female fighters and social exclusion that could bring in likely grounded in reality. Communities, schools, employers and even families would reject women after they have broken traditional female roles because they are wary of future problems. As a result, many girls and women will not receive any DDR financial assistance. Yet, these women are not remaining silent. The fact that they have the courage to speak out and tell their stories will empower them. Their experiences can help agencies like the ILO develop gender sensitive policies and programs that have a good chance of meeting their reintegration needs. To that end, the ILO IFP CRI SIS has funded research and documentation of the individual stories of the Liberian women soldiers. Once published, this document will be used for more effective program assistance. It will also complement the recent ILO funded book, Young Soldiers, Why They Fight by Rachel Breath and Irma Spetz, which identifies underlying issues that drive young people to join armed forces and recommends solutions. In an article, Women Combatants and Demobilization, Disarmament and Reintegration Process in Rwanda, Vanessa Farr refers to a small number of women involved in the DDR process. I quote, women, especially those who have been associated in armed groups, have essential roles to play in DDR processes, yet they are frequently excluded from the planning and implementation of these processes. Women, ex-combatants, in particular, often make up very small number of the forces to be demobilized and are deprioritized because they usually do not represent the same level of threat as male ex-fighters. They are frequently demobilized in countries where institutions are not only severely incapacitated by war but also have the history of excluding women. Even if there is a commitment to achieving gender equality in the peace building period, countries newly emerging from armed conflict suffer from lack of capacity in demobilization commissions, ministers and other government organs, not to mention a scarcity of funds earmarked for the support of women ex-combatants as special group. As a result of the needs of this woman are inadequately addressed in the demobilization phase and substantial support of their successful reintegration is lacking." Unquote. She further states that the ex-combatants that she had interviewed in Rwanda feels that they have both the competency 
and specific interest in assisting women caught up in armed conflict. In her view, there is a similar pool of talent and experience in other countries which should be tapped into to support and redefinition of peacekeeping. In the end, with the right support, it is the women themselves who will ensure the most vulnerable members of the society will be protected and not exploited. So, unless and until the government agencies and the UN agencies come forward in support of this woman ex-combatants, the question of woman security will always be there. Thank you.